Thank you very much for that welcome. I've just come from an exciting hour or so uh, speaking with your international relations students and really impressed by the dynamic uh, community that you have here. I'm delighted to be speaking here for many reasons. The Institute for Globalization and the Human Condition has long been an inspiration to me. Working with Professor Will Coleman's Shirk-funded major collaborative research initiative on globalization and autonomy, with many of you here, first alerted me to the challenge that globalization was posing to individual, national, and university autonomy. And it inspired my thinking about the need to combine internationalization with renewed interdisciplinary and collaborative research. I've also been impressed by Patrick Dean's judgment since he hired me long ago at Western and I've <laughs> followed his career with interest since. Um, the internationalization task force position paper forward with integrity uh, produced by the McMaster Advisory Committee uh, provides a thoughtful and well-informed survey of the challenges involved and a clear set of guidelines moving forward. It proposes the transformational model of internationalization, which enables global citizenship. The challenge for you, the McMaster and Hamilton community, will be in designing and adapting this transformational model, implementing details, and balancing the contradictory demands currently being made on universities by various stakeholders within the university, the city, the country, and increasingly the world. There are no blueprints for this process. On the contrary, there's a growing consensus that a variety of locally based approaches are likely to prove most productive. I have two epigraphs for this talk that suggest the transformations institutional and imaginative transformations that internationalization demands. Boaventura de Sousa Santos and his team claim that there is no global social justice without global cognitive justice. Well, what would global cognitive justice mean? What would it look like? Walter Mignolo argues it means that instead of a university we need a pluriversity. A pluriversity, he continues, has the responsibility of educating future generations to live not only in plurinational states, as has been declared for example in the constitutions of Bolivia and Ecuador, but also in a pluriepistemic and plura spiritual world. So with Mignolo's challenge in our minds, today's talk will build on the vision provided in the McMaster position paper, outlining my understanding of what's at stake in current internationalization agendas. And uh, this is from your website, uh, outlining how uh, this transformation might look, one way of how it might look. So building on that image, I'll be talking about my view of the global context in which universities now operate, and my personal sense of urgency about the need to build transnational research and learning cultures that can fulfill the promise of higher education for bettering our lives within our interlocking communities and for advancing our understanding of the world in which we live. I work on culture, community, and the power relations involved in knowledge construction and the stories we tell. Who knows? How do we know? Who is included? Who is excluded? How are global changes influencing what people need to know and how we learn? As an English teacher, I'm especially interested in the role of the English language in facilitating, but also sometimes blocking, transnational communication and knowledge construction. For me, 
Internationalization provides opportunities for decolonizing imperial knowledge formations. Unlearning privilege as loss expanding appreciation of diverse ways of knowing and respecting the value of all the world's languages. Increased student and faculty mobility, revised curricular and delivery structures, and collaborative transnational research projects each have contributions to make. Today, based on my experience working with various international research teams, I'll share my thoughts on what works and what doesn't work when setting up and engaging in international, interdisciplinary research, and some transsectoral networking projects. So my working definition of internationalization is taken from Canadian scholar Jane Knight. She says, internationalization is the process of integrating international, intercultural, or global dimensions into the objective function and provision of higher education. So how we respond to internationalization depends on how we view that goal of integration, who designs and facilitates its implementation, who assesses its success according to what criteria, and whose interests it serves. The fear is that integration could mean homogenization and a loss of autonomy for local universities and for professors and students within them. And there are pressures to this effect. But internationalization, if handled with sensitivity, can also lead to enriched and diversified curricula, student learning opportunities, and research cooperation. The opportunity is there. To seize it, those of us working within universities will need to cooperate with each other, both within our universities and across and beyond the higher education sector more globally. Faculty members are often best situated to drive internationalization initiatives through our expertise and our networks and through our commitments to learning as a lifelong process. We don't see knowledge as a commodity. But a neoliberal rhetoric privileging a knowledge economy dominated by a climate of crisis, insecurity, and fear, and by a fetish for measurement, does threaten to dominate what internationalization means. We can't let that framework set the agenda. So current debate about higher education often pits a romanticized vision of the past against neoliberalizing agendas in ways that don't allow for much nuance in choosing a way forward. We need to ask how we can build on the strengths of the past while moving beyond its weaknesses. Not all the demands currently made on universities stem from neoliberal agendas, but we do need to recast these debates in our own terms, building on local strengths. The McMaster-led Globalization and Autonomy team has now published eight books in our series with the University of British Columbia Press. I learned from this process and its output that it's important not to confuse the neoliberal agenda with the broader and more contradictory processes of globalization. Neoliberalism as a term is mostly used nowadays by its detractors to describe trends of market deregulation and privatization. Originally a term to describe the economic policies of the last 30 years, its use has expanded to describe an ideology of market rule, committed to replacing ideas of the public good by a valorization of individual freedom and choice. The neoliberal agenda has played a major role in globalization and in promoting views of internationalization that stress turning education into a commodity and universities into a competitive business. Nation states see themselves in competition for global talent. But internationalization can proceed on different terms. Terms that stress transnational cooperation 
and which recognize the need to extend democratic values of public participation beyond the local and national spheres into the global arena. Our globalization and autonomy team use globalization to describe all the contradictory pressures of the contemporary moment, roughly from the fall of the Berlin Wall to the present. And each volume elaborated the concept of globalization in detail in relation to each book's focus on matters such as global ordering, history, indigenization, culture, and community, with the overall aim of clarifying the choices specific circumstances allowed for enabling communal autonomy or self-determination. So by focusing on developing our definition of autonomy, a definition that maintained the concept of a public good, we challenged neoliberalism's efforts to frame the terms of the globalization debate. We also challenged neoliberalism's insistence that its dominance was inevitable with the spread of globalizing processes. And we believe that our own interdisciplinary processes of democratically deciding on our research questions and how to pursue them, presenting a Canadian-based contribution to an international conversation, was an essential element of our work. So I think this series is an inspiring example of McMaster leadership in globalization research and in pioneering a groundbreaking partnership with uh, Tunisian colleagues. So against those who see a globalizing neoliberal agenda as inevitable, I see globalization as involving a struggle over knowledge, over what knowledge means and why it matters, as well as a struggle over how world affairs should be organized and whose interests they should serve. The Building Global Democracy Program, in which I've participated over the last four years, extended this process by bringing together academics, activists, and policymakers from around the world to enhance knowledge and practice for greater public participation and control in the governance of global affairs. This program saw attention to knowledge production and sharing across societal structures as essential to advocate to advancing democratic control within a globalizing world. Through its composition and its practices, it sought to redress gender imbalance and geopolitical and linguistic inequalities, reclaiming democracy from its tainted history of imperial control by welcoming input from previously marginalized constituency into collectively redefining democracy and articulating different models of how it might work. We all learned from our structured conversations and especially from our mistakes. As Sarah Ahmed notes, and I quote, when you don't quite inhabit the norms or when you aim to transform them, you notice them as you come up against them. And her book actually illustrates this with a complete brick wall, but I've chosen a brick wall with a window in order to suggest how we can do things differently. So today's universities need to participate in this enlarged conversation, putting northern perspectives in the crossfire between multiple perspectives generated from different regions of the global south. Because we're part of this struggle over knowledge, and it's important how we describe what's at stake in negotiating its challenges. Change in itself is neither good or bad. What matters is the kind of thinking that change enables and the conditions it creates for recognizing that there is no global social justice without global cognitive justice. So some lament that universities are no longer the elite institutions they once were. More of us are coming to university than ever before. This is a good thing even when it creates new challenges for financing an expanded system. When I first came to university, most people saw the university's chief function as passing on the wisdom of the past as preservation. Now the balance has changed. The university's chief function today is research and the creation of new knowledge 
to address the problems of the present and to anticipate the future. Transformation. But all disciplines have a role to play in this project. We know we can learn from the past, but we also know that changing circumstances often lead us to see the past in a new light. Teaching and student training are changing in alignment with the shift in priorities. Learning from the past remains important, but the focus has shifted toward anticipating the future and especially preparing students for a rapidly changing world in which nation states are also changing their orientation. Universities remain important local institutions with provincial and national functions, but increasingly they operate within an international arena in which they no longer hold a monopoly on knowledge construction. So 2012 was the 25th anniversary of the European Erasmus program, which sponsored student mobility within the European Union. The European Bologna process and Lisbon strategy created a European higher education arena a little over a decade ago with the goal of harmonizing structural requirements across its membership in order to facilitate worker mobility. This supranational regional process has been very influential globally. These initiatives have attracted considerable concern about the process through which they were brought into being, the rationale justifying them, the nature of the reforms, and their implications for faculty and institutional autonomy. Businesses increasingly see opportunities for profit in higher education expansion. And massive open online courses, MOOCs, are increasing excitement about digital course delivery and accreditation. A recent subfield of academic specialization, actually studying international higher education, has arisen to chart and assess these changes and the many government and agency reports allocating routes forward. But internationalization is not a matter for specialist concern only. We all need to follow it, be concerned about it, and have some input into how it moves forward. I've recently agreed to serve on a new advisory group on international affairs and solidarity set up by the Canadian Association of University Teachers, CAUT. The international program to date is grouped around advocacy, networking, cooperation, and solidarity in international contexts. Very important principles. The COUT has developed guidelines and principles for international cooperation that include reciprocity, democracy, equity, sustainability, and transparency. These initiatives are crucial for our capacity to articulate an ethical vision of how internationalization might proceed and what it might contribute to creating a more cooperative, peaceful, and just world. One of the global initiatives being monitored by the CIUT is the assessment of higher education learning out outcomes, uh, a HELO. It's a feasibility study being cr carried out by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. The purpose, and I quote, is to design, develop, and evaluate a robust approach to measuring learning outcomes in higher education in ways that are valid across cultures and language and across the diversity of institutional settings and missions. A hello asks whether it's scientifically possible to produce cross-linguistic, cross-cultural, and cross-institutional valid comparisons of higher education learning outcomes, and whether it's feasible to implement such a system. The initial feasibility study conducted in economics and engineering is cautiously optimistic about the possibility of implementing such procedures. Um, 
no accident that those were the disciplines chosen. From my experience, I think it could be a mistake to extrapolate from this study to other disciplines. Language and culture matter more than these results seem to suggest, but the challenge will be to find creative ways of being accountable without resorting to mathematical forms of accounting alone. Writing about educational reforms in Australia, Raywin Connell explains that under a neoliberal regime, educational institutions must make themselves auditable. In the process, in her view, destroying education as an intellectual discipline, undermining teacher-generated curriculum, and destroying the humanist model of the good teacher. The steps Connell suggests to counter this process are similar to those we're undertaking in my current Shirk-funded project, the Brazil-Canada Knowledge Exchange. We seek more attention to teaching as embodied labor and to the emotional and highly collaborative work that it involves, to creating a lively, diverse, and supportive professional culture among teachers, to elaborating the intellectual structure of education, including nurturing the capacity to research, and to education as a process that creates social reality and that steers a society through historical time. Within such a model, the focus is less on itemizing capacities or isolated outcomes alone than on analyzing the relations among them. So we're approaching the halfway mark in this team project, Brazil-Canada Knowledge Exchange, which is devoted to what we're calling transnational literacies. We focus directly on how to understand situated forms of meaning making and the alternative understandings they generate. It's a partnership development project linking a few university-based research projects, professors, teachers, and teachers in training in different parts of Brazil and Canada with the aim of helping teachers of English develop strategies for promoting critical, trans-regional, and transnational literacies in their classrooms and in their research production. It's designed for Brazilians and Canadians to learn from each other and with each other as well as about each other. So our goals are number one to strengthen transnational literacy and cross-cultural understanding both within in between Brazil and Canada, two large regionally diverse countries. Number two, to work with English teachers and teachers in training to integrate theory and practice, developing site-specific pedagogies appropriate to global challenges. Three, to advocate understanding of how globalization is impacting education in Canada and in Brazil. Four, to advance the Brazil-Canada relationship. And five, to contribute to understanding how to make this kind of transnational interdisciplinary partnership work. We're still figuring out how to advance these various goals together. We've been generating some great workshops for teachers and students and some exciting interactions when we meet in person. But it remains difficult to generate the intensive interdisciplinary dialogues we need and to facilitate regular exchanges on an ongoing basis, sharing work in progress and co-producing work. Despite the virtual connections now enabled by new technologies, face-to-face -face interactions in a dedicated time period still work best for multi-sided teams. There's also many cultural differences to negotiate and deeply ingrained assumptions to challenge within both countries. These challenges are what make the work valuable and it's often fun to work these things through together when we meet in person. When you're dealing with issues that matter to people, the interactions become deeply rewarding. Yet, while this project is less ambitious in scope than the other ones I described I'm finding it too is more complex than expected. Many institutional barriers still exist 
for unconventional team projects. These exist at all levels, within the university, the profession, and across national borders. So as an outgrowth of the Globalization Autonomy Project, I also participated in a smaller two-year project, Building South-North Dialogue on Globalization Research, also run by Will Coleman with seed funding from 2007 to 2008. This project also brought research on globalization from the Global South into more sustained dialogue with research from Canada and the Global North through two funded workshops which led to an unsuccessful grant application for future work. So why was building global democracy and globalization autonomy, why were they successful in gaining funding and why was this third one not? The answers are complex um, but I'll try to elaborate some of the factors I think might be relevant uh, for your work at McMaster as you consider the possibility of setting up a university-wide center for global engagement. Both projects were ahead of their time, in some ways too ambitious, but in others maybe not ambitious enough. Some of you might remember that globalization autonomy was also unsuccessful in gaining funding its first year when we applied under the title Globalization Autonomy and the Human Condition. It now seems astonishing to me we could have gone forward with such a broad title, but we took it from a center here at McMaster and didn't think sufficiently to differentiate the mandate of a center for teaching and research based at a single university from the goals of a multi-university research project. Once we narrowed our focus, we found ourselves with a tighter and more manageable project. We did make it to the shortlist that first year, which included an hour's interview with an eight-person multidisciplinary committee. Their questions help us refine our thinking about what interdisciplinarity involved, why it mattered, and how it might be achieved. We had been focusing most of our attention on our subject matter, globalization, and had not thought enough about the methodological challenges that come with any type of multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, or transdisciplinary work, nor which kind of experimentation within these models might work best for our project. So from this first failure, we learned several valuable lessons. First, don't give up. These things can take time and team support is crucial. The principal investigator has to pull it all together and bear the brunt of the responsibility but there also has to be a team with him or her to pull their weight. It has to be a team effort from the beginning and all the way through, and it is a big commitment for everyone. So be clear about what you can contribute and how it will work for you. The senior members of our management team knew that we wanted the challenge and could afford the risks. For the more junior members and the students especially, it was a riskier venture given that silos still operate at many levels of assessment and it's still necessary to prove yourself in disciplinary terms and through single authored ventures, at least in the humanities and social sciences, even if co-authorship and partnership work is also beginning to gain some credibility in some circles. I think it is the way of the future. In Canada, grant adjudication criteria are changing but in other areas of adjudication, such as hiring, tenure and promotion, and publication, criteria are not changing as quickly as they need to. So our team was committed to building a transgenerational network, and we recognized the need to provide extra support and different kinds of training for the junior members of our team to help them negotiate this transitional moment in globalizing forms of knowledge production and knowledge assessment. As the job market changes and university structures shift, the question of what kinds of training are needed requires more thought. The changing conditions of knowledge production and dissemination are a factor that no current team project can ignore. Partly for this reason, I've recently joined a project just funded from Finland called Ethical Internationalism in Higher Education in Times of Global Crisis. 
This is a post-colonial and decolonial project working to legitimate and integrate pluriversal modes of understanding into citizenship education and to balance an increasing focus on technical training with cross-cultural studies of, sorry, cross-cultural modes of performance. Our team has also been selected as a formal network within the World Education Research Association, an association of national educational associations. So these kinds of institutional structures are proliferating at the global level. This unfunded honor involves several obligations over the next few years, including producing a substantive report that integrates the state of knowledge worldwide and to set forth some promising research directions moving forward. While most members of the team work in faculties of education from around the world, some of us are in English, gender, and native studies and applied linguistics. This work is going to be essential, I think, for pooling information and better unlocking the creative potential of international cooperation for facilitating cross-cultural learning opportunities. Despite all the publications in this area, there's still a dearth of useful data that could facilitate meaningful transnational comparisons. We still don't know enough about the internationalization initiatives taking place, um, often within our own university as well as internationally. So among the many models now emerging for transformational internationalization, across the institution. I think the University of Warwick's Global Priorities Program, which is identified by the slogan, Responding Through Research to Global Challenges, is worth examining for the choices they made in the first year of its existence, not necessarily as a model to follow, but part of seeing what's out there. Uh, they chose a multidisciplinary model rather than an inter or transdisciplinary model, and it's still a model that, that preserves disciplines more or less intact. Uh, work faculty have uh, chosen to focus research on what they call key areas of international significance. Um, and they selected the following overarching themes each of which has its own kind of branding slogan, another internationalization trend of today. So there's connecting cultures, building bridges to cultural understanding, digital change, realizing the digital future, energy, powering the world through renewable energy, food security, developing a sustainable food system for all, global governance, establishing better rules for a better world, individual behavior, understanding human thinking and decision making, innovative manufacturing, ensuring global prosperity, international development, strengthening global communities, and science and technology for health, health care for the global age, sorry, health care for the digital age. So I think this rearrangement is one step beyond the strategic plans that each Canadian university has now adopted. Like them, it's still largely generic, providing an umbrella for most of the work done within most disciplines. But also attempting to set priorities and identify strengths, the difference is that now each incorporates an explicitly global dimension and global focus. Um, and this reorganization to the global has the following aims. A, to highlight and celebrate research excellence. B, to communicate that excellence to external audiences. C, to foster cross-departmental communication and collaboration. D, to enhance research grant income. And E, to facilitate research impact. So the language is familiar. Most universities are currently engaging in similar exercises of more or less ambition. My point is that within this broad framework of institutionalization, there is significant room for distinctive responses based on each university's evolving identity and the needs of its various communities. 
So um, I had the chance to visit uh, work this summer and take part in a day and a half of the deliberations of the unit working on global governance and was really impressed with the year-long work they had done through their meetings in fully fleshing out uh, a, a research program for going forward. Uh, I'm also going to be spending the rest of this semester at Linnaeus University Center concurrences in colonial and post-colonial studies in Sweden, which is one of three new interdisciplinary centers set up there this year, last year, to learn more about how they're working to build transnational research and learning cultures in their region. So as you examine your curriculum, your research, your partnerships in these areas, it'll be important to be clear about the degree of interdisciplinarity that's important for your personnel and for your project. And if you opt for a stronger degree of interdisciplinarity, to consult the research on how to make it work, to think carefully about the disciplinary and sectoral expertise you'll need on your teams to reach your goals. I'm sure you've already been holding group discussions about these questions. Uh, it's a good idea to run trial interviews um, to explain what you're doing to different kinds of audiences, anticipate their critiques, and adjust for their advice and to think especially about the implications of your choices for methodology as you begin the research, the training, the writing, and prepare to communicate your work through publications. To recognize that different disciplines respond differently to interdisciplinary challenges and to decide how much effort you need to make to include a range of perspectives. One of the more useful practices we developed in globalization and autonomy was to share individually produced work in progress through a process that involved circulating the draft to a subgroup in advance and assigning two people from disciplines different from that of the author to present the draft to the group commenting on how they saw its argument, its method, its relation to our overall project goals and the contribution it was making to them. And we did this with every chapter in our communities volume, sometimes two or three times for three years running. And it really helped us see where we needed to work harder to define and refine our terms, to refine our theoretical frameworks, and to communicate our message to audiences beyond those that we normally addressed within our specialized epistemic community of readers. And in the end, each volume made different methodological and rhetorical choices in communicating its results. So that some volumes, for example, remained deliberately diverse and others created a more integrated impression. Some ended with conclusions, wrapping things up or an epilogue and others had no formal concluding chapter. In retrospect, we realized that in designing our project, we paid more attention to globalization than we did to autonomy. We didn't fully realize we all had somewhat different understandings of what autonomy meant until about the third year of team interaction. Uh, it was pretty amazing to us. We talked a bit about autonomy, quite a bit about autonomy, but, but didn't realize we were thinking about, some were thinking about individual autonomy, some were thinking about collective autonomy, and then what we meant by autonomy could be quite radically different. Uh, a 2010 book called Asia as Method Toward De-Imperialization points out the many conceptual slippages in translations of key political terms from English into Chinese, Japanese, and Taiwanese scholarship and the major analytical differences they introduce into how contemporary democratizing and modernizing challenges are understood in these contexts. The author, Quan Sing Chen, argues that moving the point of reference away from the United Kingdom and the United States changes the understanding of analytical terms such as civil society, state, and informal economy. These communicational issues really matter, and yet they're not receiving nearly enough attention. And we've encountered similar moments 
similar blockages, which can sometimes lead to transformational openings in all the team projects in which I've been engaged. So how to build genuine sites of difference into internationalization initiatives such as yours while also ensuring your work makes sense to external adjudicators who may be less attuned to the shifting conditions of knowledge production globally will be a major challenge for projects such as yours moving forward. The Building Global Democracy Project began to tackle this problem on an ambitious global scale, setting up a series of conversations that were simultaneously transregional, translinguistic, transdisciplinary, and transsectoral. They were expensive to run. And again, I think, I think we learned most from the obstacles we encountered and from our failures to fully anticipate some of them. What we found in these projects was that sometimes each discipline also may use a particular term in a distinctive way, not realizing that other disciplines understand the same term differently. When you're working transnationally, these misunderstandings can be compounded by different histories and political experiences, making it even more crucial to sort these out. The source now dialogue project never fully came to terms with these challenges, in part because we lacked the time to develop an understanding of how important they were, but also because we were never able to draw convincing connections across connecting the disparate interests of our members. Even with the narrower focus of the Brazil-Canada project, we're finding our awareness of cultural differences grow as we grow more familiar with each other, and more willing to address these misunderstandings in the detail they require. So as a literary scholar with a background in post-colonial cultural studies, I'm interested in the frameworks that a group sets itself, the vocabulary it employs, and the assumptions embedded in these. Naming is not neutral. And I, I could talk at more length about the insights provided from colleagues in other parts of the world into the ideological implications that they saw in terms that to me initially seemed either neutral or even sometimes positive. So once you framed your own group synergies locally, you may find that initial framings need to be rethought and questions rephrased to address a range of new perspectives. Uh, some of you may remember that we had what to our principal investigator seemed a small team rebellion at our first full team meeting in globalization and autonomy. As the group took full ownership of the project by revising its methodology, changing its questions and refining its goals. It was the flexibility and openness to criticism of our management team that enabled us to strengthen the project and the group spirit through this experience, which, if it had been handled differently, could have led to a failure. Our principal investigator still wishes he could have anticipated and corrected for these animated discussions at that first meeting, but I think it's this kind of surprise that teamwork will often throw up for us if things are going well and people trust each other enough to have a say in how they go forward. So in today's talk, I've tried to cover a lot of ground and I look forward to talking about it more with you in the question period. I've stressed that internationalization needs to be coupled with collaborative and transdisciplinary initiatives if it's going to transform older models of the university into pluriversity structures that can work toward transforming cognitive justice into global justice. Not all globalizing processes are leading to homogenization, but they are compelling the reorganization and the refocusing of knowledge. We need to embrace this transformational task as an opportunity to enhance education's emancipatory potential and its capacity to benefit from what Arjun Apadurai calls the right to research 
beyond its conventionally narrow confines. The McMaster position paper testifies to the strength of your analysis and to your commitment to getting this right. I look forward to your questions now and to discussing um, these things with you during the rest of my visit. I'll be here tomorrow as well. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>